Um, I would like to welcome you all and thank you all for coming. This is the 14th annual Siddhartha Maitra Lecture. Um, I'm Alison Galloway. I'm the campus provost and executive vice chancellor. I'm also a, an anthropology professor, so this is probably an appropriate uh, lecture for me to introduce. The Mitral Lecture is really one of the highlights of the academic year, uh, and it has become one of the signature founder celebration events. It's one of the things we, all, we look forward to. We've had, uh, this is the 14th annual, so we have 13 other years of these lectures. There have been notable writers, uh, academics, artists, Nobel laureates, Silicon Valley CEOs. The thing that has really united all of these lectures is that they touch on broader issues, issues that really address what makes us human, why are we the way we are. So we have everything from Sandy Faber talking about the modern genesis and limits of cosmic knowledge, to uh, Sashi Tharoor talking about globalism, terrorism, and the human imagination. So that's quite a diverse group of things, but that theme of what is it that makes us the way we are uh, is something that th threads through the Mitra lectures. The lecture series is sponsored by the UC Santa Cruz Foundation, and so we owe them some thanks. We also um, owe thanks to, particularly to the foundation trustee, Franz Landing, for an extending a personal invitation to tonight's speaker. Tonight's speaker is Wade Davis. Presumably you already know that. Um, and he is also accompanied by his wife, Gail Percy, who, uh, as we find out, is a UCSC alumna. Uh, Wade is probably a little tired, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm amazed by his energy, because I know he spent most of the day with the anthropology department. Uh, he gave a workshop to the faculty and the PhD students, and at that he spoke about anthropology and its publics. And what he was talking about is how do we build understanding and appreciation for what anthropologists do amongst the broader spectrum of the public. And so I think this was something, a very lively discussion and that everybody enjoyed. I will put a plug in for the anthropology graduate program, which I think and many other people think is probably one of the most uh, renowned anthropology uh, departments in the, in the nation because of its unique approach to anthropology its focus on emerging worlds and the issues of culture and power. But in particular, we owe a lot of support, a lot of thanks right now to Anu Luther Maitre. She is the, has been a great friend of UC Santa Cruz for many years. She has served on the foundation board and was a found, former foundation president. Currently, she is the special advisor to the Chancellor on International Initiatives. She is also the founder of this event, and therefore I would like to introduce her to talk about the lecture series and also the speaker tonight. So, Anu. Uh, thank you, Alison, for making time for us in what I know to be your manic schedule. And welcome, Wade and Gail. And thank you, Franz and Chris, for bringing your friends here to us. And to my family here tonight, Arjun and Kiran, Tom and Julio, and to my friends who slept themselves over the hill every year, a big thank you for your support. And hello to everybody. This year's lecture is a tribute to my late husband Siddharth's general spirit of adventure, which characterized most everything he did. It wasn't just that he roamed the earth. He did it in full measure, trekking in the Patagonia, across the barren Tibetan plateau, up to Everest Base Camp, and on the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, under a sky that had a firecracker of a comet in it. Swimming with the sharks, giant manta rays, and turtles in Tahiti and the Galapagos. Bush piloting and dog sledding across Alaska. Aurora Borealis lighting his way. Shooting solar eclipses with his Hasselblad in the deserts of Turkey and Rajasthan. And shooting the rapids of the Urubamba with only his Joe Cool sunglasses. <laughs> On the ground, under ocean surfaces, 
from the open skies that he loved, Sid gazed at Earth and all its life forms and found tranquility, but also meaning. His commitment to the idea of humanism was direct and simple, based on a scientific understanding and recognition of our common genetic makeup as a species and its corollary equation, who we are is what we do. While he was around, he almost always charmed me and some of his friends to go along on his travels and with his ideas. But even in death, he seems to be taking our hands and leading us into a different kind of journey of exploration, but with similar aha moments. With the heartbreaking lyrical morning rite that was the inaugural Maitre lecture on friendship and poetry, Vikram Sait lit a fire and created a community around it, the capacity audience that year upon year gathers together in this recital hall. Subsequent keepers of the flame have taken us to the movies and the inner labyrinths of our own identity and imagination, through hospital corridors, on a glider, into a ballroom, onto the battlefields of Kurukshetra to listen in on Krishna speaking the Gita, into spaceships that have taken us dangerously close to an incredibly loud bang. Last year, we were instructed to bring our own bejeweled parasols into this recital hall. But as we arrived, those umbrellas magically merged into one giant canopy of community under which Peter Sellers took us to a Buddha field, a pure manifestation of wisdom. Today, that canopy has been transformed into the thatched roof of a maloka, a log house in the Amazon forest. We are here to listen to stories of faraway lands, some belonging to the once upon a time genre. True to form, the space is vast, its symmetry exquisite, and waters of the Pacific are not far. If you listen carefully, you can hear drums in the distance. And I'm sort of, a lot of these things that I'm, I'm looking at Wade directly and sort of addressing him is because there are sort of just perfect words that I have, uh, expressions that I've taken from his writings, but it's very hard to go quote, quote all the time, so I'm just going to assume that <laughs> he knows what he's written. <laughs> and of course there is a shaman, Professor Wade Davis. He brings with him the black jaguar that once showed him the way out of the swamp, and a rattle that contains the seeds of the kana fruit, one he will use to transform a heart and soul. But, just to be sure, he has also brought for us a frothy decoction of the yage, the vision wine, that will allow us to collectively soar with him and learn the secrets of preserving order in our world. Wade is eminently qualified. He grew up in beautiful British Columbia and Quebec, drawn to the wild. At age 14, he visited Columbia, where he encountered the warmth and benevolence of a people charged with an unfamiliar intensity, a passion for life, and a quiet acceptance of the frailty of the human spirit. He returned to South America as a student at Harvard, studying ethnobotany with the iconic Richard Schultes, who also sent him to Haiti in search of the poison that could make zombies out of people. It was a defining professional moment for Wade, I think. He has said that he found himself questioning the rigidity of his scientific perspectives. His books on the subject, The Serpent and the Rainbow and Passage of Darkness, made him instantly famous with their masterful blend of the scientific and the exotic. And this very fine balance, very hard to achieve, is something that he's preserved in all his writing. After these rites of initiation, he traveled extensively in the Americas, living among 15 indigenous groups in eight Latin American countries, while gathering 
6,000 plant collections. Importantly, he lived with them, danced with them, drunk their yage, and shared their blood. He is the ultimate empathete. Wade has also gone to the forests of Borneo, met the wisdom heroes of Tibet, and the hunters of the brown hyena in the Kalahari Desert. And he knows more shamans than I can count. He has sailed the oceans of Polynesia in a four-hulled catamaran with no sextant, no depth gauge, no GPS, no transponder. But don't feel too sorry for him. His companion was the wayfinder, Nainoa Thompson, who was all these instruments and more integrated into one man. Is it any wonder that Dr. Wade Davis is fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, has been named as an explorer for the millennium by the National Geographic Society, and is their explorer in residence. Although I don't know what that means, I can bet you that he's rarely in residence. <laughs> as I was tracing Wade's footsteps on moss, moraine, and sand, reading his books, listening to his TED Talks, looking at his photographs, so I could present him faithfully to you, at one point, frustrated, I exclaimed to myself, I can't wrap my fingers around this guy. He's too multidimensioned, too prolific, and much too complex. Dimension. We know Wade is an adventurer, but he's also a Harvard certified ethnobotanist and anthropologist, a writer, a photographer, curator, and filmmaker, a public speaker and television host, a devoted father and husband. That makes 10 dimensions. Hey, we've reached the magic world of strings in which we could have a theory of everything. <laughs> and I could even go to 11 if that's what the theory needs. But he'd better know it. We are all yours. Prolific, 15 best-selling books. His latest, Into the Silence, won the Samuel Johnson Prize, the top award for literary nonfiction in English. Lectures at 400 eminent educational institutions. 180 scientific and popular articles in the most prestigious print media. Photographs that have appeared in 20 books and 80 magazines and are represented in the permanent collection of the US State Department. But I cannot let this comment on his prodigious output stop there. There is the quality of his writing, lush, delicate, and perfectly composed. Take one comma away, replace an adjective or an adverb, and the effect is lost. Like a beautiful forest, or just the right admixture. Complex. His subjects have ranged from Haitian, Haitian voodoo, an Amazonian myth to the global diversity crisis, the traditional uses of psychotropic drugs, and the ethnobotany of indigenous tribes. But on the issue of complexity, I changed my mind. The music we hear is complex and haunting, but the rhythm of the drums, repeated through time and across cultures, is simple, as wisdom should be. It speaks of a sacred connection to Earth and to our ancestors, and it incorporates the idea that wealth comes from giving, not having. Like a Patek Philippe watch, you never actually own the land. You only hold it in trust for the next generation. Wade's special brand of ethnospheric humanism connects man to man, woman to woman, and even woman to man by taking a cultural detour, first joining each human to the gorgeous planet that we share. At a time when the great evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson has called for a pact of consilience between the squabbling siblings, the humanities and the sciences, Wade Davis is the point at which they meet. Master shaman that he is, with Jaguar, Kana and Yage. He calls up from somewhere deep within us the spirit of love, 
the ultimate act of giving for us, humans all. I think that Sid, the incurable rationalist, would be happy with our choice of speaker and his methodology with no sacrifice of scientific rigor, a hero tells stories that enchant and convince. And neither, I think, would Wade quarrel with Sid's favorite equation, we are what we do. Thank you very much. And I give to you Professor Wade Davis. I think after that, we should just go home. <laughs> I mean, how do you begin to top a presentation like that? Who would want to? And you know, Anu, we had a wonderful party thanks to our beloved friends, Chris and Franz, and poor Anu stumbled coming out, and believe it or not, that eloquence came out of a woman who's cracked open her skull within the last 15 minutes, has patched herself up, and uh, I think we should give her a hand for that, you know? I'm so delighted to be with you. Um, Anu mentioned that my beloved wife, Gail, graduated from this uh, university, so it's been a great joy for me to be back here with Gail today. You know, one of the, uh, the great pleasures of travel, and certainly the delights of being engaged in ethnographic research, is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways who still feel the past in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that as we sit here in Santa Cruz tonight, in the Amazon, jaguar shaman can journey beyond the Milky Way, or that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning, or that in the Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember the central revelation of anthropology. And that is the idea that the world into which you were born does not exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality. The consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your cultural lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, or a yak herder in the slopes of Shomalungma, Mount Everest, an eagle hunter of central Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof shaman of Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of being, other ways of thinking, other ways of orienting yourself in social, spiritual, ecological space. And that's an idea that if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now, together, the myriad of cultures of the world make up a, a social, intellectual web of life that envelops the planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as is the biological web of life that you know so well as a biosphere. And in a book I wrote many years ago, I, I coined the term ethnosphere as a kind of organizing principle to try to account for this parallel realm of existence, which, of course, is a cultural web of life that envelops the planet as well. And I define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, ideas and intuitions, myths and memories brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great achievement. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative and imaginative species. And just as the biosphere is being severely impacted with the loss of habitat and the concomitant loss of plant and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere, but if anything, at a far greater rate. No biologist, for example, would dare to suggest that 50% of all plants and animals are moribund, because it simply is not true. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. 
When each of you in this room were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on earth. Now, a language isn't simply vocabulary or grammatical structures. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture reaches into the material world. Every language I once wrote is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages spoken the day that you were born, today by complete academic consensus, fully half are not being whispered into the ears of infants. They're not being taught to children, which effectively means they're on the brink of extinction. Now, there are many people who say, well, wouldn't the world be a more integrated place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier for us to get along? And my answer to that is always to say, what a brilliant idea. But let's make that universal language in Nuptatak. Let's make it Tibetan. Let's make it Navajo. Let's make it Haida. Let's make it Kitsan. Let's make it... And you suddenly begin to feel, as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. And yet that dreadful plight is indeed the fate of somebody somewhere on earth every fortnight because on average, every two weeks, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. Now, the reason this is such a poignant backdrop to our age is that it's happening just at the point in human history where science has finally proven it to be true, something that philosophers always dreamt to be true. And that is the fact that we're all literally brothers and sisters. Now, I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean quite literally studies of the human genome have left no doubt whatsoever that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race is an utter fiction. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. We are all, in fact, descendants of the same handful of people who walked out of Africa some 60, 65,000 years ago and then embarked on the most extraordinary hegira, a diaspora 40,000 years in duration, 25 hundred human generations that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But here's the important point. If you accept the scientific truth that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, it means by definition that all human populations share the same, genetic, uh, the same mental acuity, the same raw human potential, the same intellectual genius. And critically, whether that genius is invested into technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement of the West, or placed by contrast into the challenge of unraveling the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the affairs of culture. The old 19th century idea that we went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized to the strand of London has been utterly exposed by modern science to be an artifact of the 19th century as irrelevant to our lives today as a notion that clergymen had in that era that the earth was only 4,000 years old. In this sort of stunning affirmation of the interconnection of the human spirit, science has proven to be true the central revelation of cultural anthropology, the genius of Franz Boas, the notion of cultural relativism. And of course, what this ultimately means is that the other peoples of the world, the other cultures of the world, are not failed attempts at being you. They're not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices. And those voices collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us as a species in the coming millennia. So the question becomes, 
what can we do about this? You know, if you're a biologist and you identify an area of high species endemism, you can create a protected area. But you can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't freeze people in time or space like some kind of zoo zoological specimen. Change, in fact, is the one constant in human affairs. All cultures are always dancing with new possibilities for life. So when I was recruited to the National Geographic as an explorer in residence as part of their conservation mission some 15 years ago, we really asked ourselves, what can we do about this? You know, it was a haunting consensus. I, I tried to find a single linguist anywhere in North America, anywhere in Europe, who would dispute the notion that half the languages were disappearing, which of course meant that within this one generation, we were losing half of humanity's um, intellectual, social, spiritual knowledge. I couldn't find anyone who disputed that fundamental um, uh, scientific fact. And so we asked ourselves, what can we do to address this challenge? You know, polemics are never persuasive. Politicians follow, they never lead. But I concluded that actually storytellers change the world. And the only way we could really address this issue was through narrative and by taking our enormous audience of the National Geographic to points in the ethnosphere, if you will, where the beliefs and practices were so not only inherently dazzling, but that, that absolutely d demonstrated this fundamental truth of anthropology, all with the hope that maybe our readers and our viewers would come away with a new appreciation of the wonder of culture. So we didn't go off in these projects with these films to do what so many um, people do to sort of celebrate the exoticism of the other. We went to points in the ethnosphere where we could identify cultural practices that were so mind-blowing, so dazzling, that you couldn't help but come away with this new appreciation. So for example, with Mathieu Ricard, I made a film called The Buddhist Science of the Mind. Now that may seem odd to you. Why would you use the word science for what is obviously a religious tradition? But what, after all, is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is Tibetan Buddhism but 2,500 years of direct empirical observation as to the nature of mind? Mathieu once said to me, you know, Western science is too often a major response to minor needs. We spend all of our lifetime trying to live to be 100 without losing our teeth. Whereas in Tibet, they spend all of their lifetime trying to understand the nature of existence. Our billboards celebrate teenagers in underwear. The money walls of the Tibetans are prayers for the well-being of all sentient creatures. And so this evening, I'd like to take you to some of these places where we journey to celebrate the wonder of ourselves. And let's begin with the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination. And this, of course, is Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon a southern sea. I was very fortunate to be invited, as Anu mentioned, by my good friend Nainoa Thompson to join the sailors of the Polynesian Voyaging Society on the sacred vessel of Hawaii, the Hokalea, named after the sacred star of that archipelago. And even today, on this vessel, modeled on the drawings that Joseph Banks did in his journal as he traveled with Captain Cook through the South Pacific in the 18th century. On this vessel today, the sailors of the Polynesian Voyage and Society can name 350 stars in the night sky. They can sense the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon simply by watching carefully the reverberation of waves across the hull of the vessel knowing full well that every island group in the Pacific has its own unique refractive pattern that can be read with the same perspicacity with which a, finger, a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. These are sailors who in the darkness of the hull of the vessel can distinguish as many as five different sea swells moving through the sacred canoe at any one point in time, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the ocean and can be followed with the same ease with which a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, 
what you would get as Polynesia. But the most astonishing thing about this tradition of navigation was that it was all based on dead reckoning. And dead reckoning meant that you only knew where you were by remembering precisely how you got there. Now, it was the impossibility of using dead reckoning on a long oceanic voyage that kept European transports, for the most part, hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of the chronometer. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before the Christian era, the ancestors of the Polynesians from an ancient civilization called Lapita off the northern shores of New Guinea and New Caledonia set sail into the rising sun. In a thousand years, they reached Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, and then they stopped for 10 centuries, but then they sailed on 4,000 kilometers across the central Pacific through the Cook Islands, Tahiti, and eventually the Marquesas, and then northwest to Hawaii, southeast to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and eventually around the time of the first crusade reaching the islands that we now call New Zealand. All of that was based on dead reckoning, which meant that the navigator, the wayfinder, sitting man or woman, monk-like on the stern of the vessel, had to remember every shift of the wind, every shift of the currents, every sign of the sea, the stars, the moon, and the heavens. And if they lost that track of knowledge, all would be condemned to die. And that's the most amazing thing about this tradition. Now, if we go from the greatest ocean sphere, let us enter the greatest forest on Earth, the Amazon, a forest the size of the continental United States, more poetically put, a forest the size of the face of the full moon. We enter the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, Makuna, Tanimukos, Tucanos. These are individuals who believe that mythologically they came up the Milk River from the east in the belly of the sacred serpent, the anaconda, only to be regurgitated onto the banks of the affluence of the northwest Amazon. A people who live so intimately with that forest that literally, cognitively, they do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the rainforest. A people who we now understand are literally the descendants of the ancient civilizations of the Amazon that Aureliana saw when he went down the river in 1541, the dense populations of as many as 10 million people who were swept away by European diseases. And remember, when we use that term decimate, indig indigenous people in the Americas were never decimated by European diseases because decimate in Latin means to kill one in 10. It was quite the opposite. 90% of Amerindian people from Tierra del Fuego to the high Arctic were swept away by smallpox and measles, often within a decade or so of contact. But we now know that these societies that were on the brink of exhaustion not 40 years ago represent the upcountry cousins of those civilizations. They have social structures that favor knowledge and peace, not war, not the least of which is a marriage rule that says you must marry someone who speaks a different language. And so in any one longhouse, you have six and seven languages spoken, but you never hear a child practicing a distinct tongue. They simply wait, watch, and listen, and one day learn to speak. Now, if we come down to a very different group of societies along the eastern flank of the Cordillera into the homeland of the Warani, the Warani were fascinating because they were first peacefully contacted in 1958, fully five years after I was born, even though their homeland, as a crow flies, is but 120 kilometers from Quito, a city that's been settled for almost 500 years. The Warani were an extraordinary people, and one of the things that was so dramatic is that when the missionaries attempted contact in 1956, they made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by 10 glossy photographs of themselves in what we would culturally say to be friendly gestures, but they forgot that the people of the rainforest had never seen anything two-dimensional in their lives. They picked up the photographs from the forest floor, looked behind the face to try to find the form to the figure, found nothing, and concluded, not inaccurately, that these were calling cards from the devil. 
And so when the missionaries arrived, they promptly speared them to death. But the Warani didn't just spear outsiders. We traced genealogies back eight generations, found two cases of natural death, and when we pressured the people a little bit about it, they admitted that one of the fellows had gotten so old, he died getting old, so we speared him anyway. Uh, 54% of their mortality was due to them spearing each other. But they had a perspicacious knowledge of the forest that was astonishing. Their hunters could smell animal urine at 40 paces and tell you what form of life had left that behind, not because they were sauvage in some kind of Rousseauian sense, but because they were true natural philosophers who had paid attention with such care to the forest upon which their lives depended. And it was precisely that kind of acuity that drew us as ethnobotanists to the Amazon. And I was very, very fortunate to uh, attend Harvard College, but fall into the orbit of this extraordinary man, Richard Evan Schultes, the man who sparked the psychedelic era with his discovery of the magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938. I was a young student um, of anthropology. Actually, I became a student of anthropology quite by accident. The deadline to make your choice was the next day, and I happened to have wandered out of the Peabody Museum for the first time, uh, and my mind was swirling with all these images of all the shaman dressed in all the colors of the rainbow. And I ran into a friend of mine in the street his name is Stuart, and I said, Stuart, what are you going to declare tomorrow? And he said, anthropology. And I said, what's that? Well, you read about Indians, and like Forrest Gump, I said, that'll do. And I signed on in anthropology, having no idea what it was. And after two years of just reading about Indians, I, was, I wanted to live with Indians. And I was in the, a cafe in Harvard Square with my roommate, who had similar sentiments, also an anthro student, and there was a National Geographic map of the world right in front of us. And David looked to the map, and he looked to me, and he looked to the map, and he suddenly pointed to the high Arctic of Canada. Well, I had to go somewhere, and I watched my left arm lift, and it hit the Amazon. If, if it had hit Italy, I might have become a Renaissance scholar. But having decided to go to the Amazon, there was only one man to see, this kindly professor who shot blowguns in class, and kept outside his door a bucket of peyote buttons available to his students as an optional laboratory experiment. <laughs> Schultes, having solved the uh, mystery of Oluwiki and Tehuanacatl, the long-lost Aztec hallucinogens, having sparked the psychedelic era, he disappeared in 1941 into the northwest Amazon, where he remained for 13 uninterrupted years, traveling down unknown rivers, living amongst unknown peoples, all the time enchanted by the wonder of the neotropical rainforest. In time, mountains would bear his name, as would national parks, and Prince Philip would call him the father of the Amazon, but he was an odd choice to become a 60s icon because his politics were wildly conservative. He didn't vote for the Republican Party. He professed not to believe in the American Revolution. He always voted for Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. So at the age, one of his colleagues, in fact, once said of Schultes, the only way for Schultes to go native would be to go to London. <laughs> and I knew nothing of this history when at the age of 18, I knocked on the door of his fourth floor Erie at the Botanical Museum at Harvard, and I got as far as saying, sir, I'm from British Columbia. That's all it took. The adjective British, and he, he thought I was talking about that Columbia where he had made his life. And I said, I've saved up money in a logging camp I want to go to the Amazon as you did and collect plants. And at the time, I had never taken a biology course in my life. I knew nothing about the Amazon. And yet this man who ranks with Richard Spruce, Henry Bates, Lord Alfred Wallace, even Darwin in a way, simply peered across a mound of plant specimens through his antiquated bifocals and said very simply, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I was in the Amazon where I stayed for 15 months. And just before I left, he said, never forget what Paracelsus said. The difference between a poison and medicine and narcotic and a hallucinogen is just dosage. <laughs> so, so we were always on the outlook for biodynamic plants, such as this one, Karari, the flying death, the legendary arrow poisons and dart poisons, which of course don't kill the prey. They have an compound detubocararine, a profound muscle relaxant, which causes the animal to lose all muscular control, and it dies as it falls from the canopy. 
And of course, invariably, this ethnopharmacological pursuit led us into the realm of the shaman. Now, if you follow the work of those really important California anthropologists and authorities such as Shirley MacLaine, you would think that the shaman is a kind of benign grandfather figure with feathers and bells who sings well. I've been with a lot of shaman in my life. I've never been with one who wasn't psychotic. That's their job. As Joseph Campbell said, they're the ones who swim in the mystic waters the rest of us would drown in. They're the ones who go into these metaphysical realms that most of us, in all cultures, want to avoid as we're simply raising our children. And the shamanic art of healing, of course, is based on a very different notion as to the origin and nature of disease. Disease is not defined as the presence of pathogens, but as a state of disequilibrium when the spiritual, physical components of the individual no longer have their proper rest. And so the essential act of healing is a metaphysical act. Yes, diseases can be treated symptomatically, much as we do, uh, only with medicinal plants, many of which are pharmacologically active and yield, have yielded important drugs for our pharmacopoeia. But fundamentally, that somatic treatment of illness is seen as something mundane. To really get to the source of the problem, whether it's social, physical, economic, the shaman must invoke some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance, to get into those very distant metaphysical realms where he or she can work their deeds of medical, magical, mystical rescue. And that accounts for one of the most curious anomalies in botanical science, which is the fact of the 120 known hallucinogenic plants on Earth, 95% are from the Americas. Not because the forests of equatorial West Africa were depauperate, or the forests of Southeast Asia for that matter, but simply because, as we'll see in a moment, people there had other avenues to the divine. But the route to the Godhead in the Americas was mediated by these plants that so intrigued Professor Schultes. Plants like this one, Ebene, in this photograph he took in 1956. Ebene derived from the blood-red resin of several species in the genus Varola in the nutmeg family, made into a powder, and these powders are chock full of powerful tryptamines, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, dimethyltryptamine, very close to brain serotonin. To have these powders blown up your nose is rather like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with Baroque paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. It creates not the distortion of reality, it creates the disillusion of reality. In fact, I used to argue with Professor Schultes that you couldn't classify these as being hallucinogenic because by the time you're under the influence, there was no one home anymore to experience the hallucination. But the reason we're intrigued by these plants is not simply their dazzling pharmacological effects, but what they can tell us about another way of knowing. The reason the Yanomami blow those snuffs up the nose is that tryptamines are orally inactive. They cannot be taken through the mouth because they're denatured by an enzyme found naturally in the human gut called monoamine oxidase. They can only be taken orally if taken in conjunction with some other compound that denatures the MAO in the human stomach. Now, if we go to the most notorious of all the preparations of the shaman's repertoire, ayahuasca, the vision vine, we see this alchemy in action. Because ayahuasca is not an individual plant, it's a combination of plants. On the one hand, the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the genus Psychotria in the coffee family, chock full of tryptamines, but also the bark of a woody liana in a completely different group of plants in the family known as the Malpighiaceae. These, the bark of the woody liana contains beta-carbolines, harmine and harmaline, which turn out to be MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamines found in the leaves. Now, you don't have to worry about that phytochemistry, but you have to think about this. How, in a flora of 80,000 species of vascular plants, did the shaman learn to combine these completely distinct morphologically distinct denizens of the rainforest to create this powerful synergistic effect, the botanical equivalent, if you will, of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. The only scientific explanation is trial and error. 
which is quickly, statistically, exposed as a meaningless euphemism. You ask the native people, and they say the plants teach us. What does that mean? When Schultes was with the Siona Sequoia in 1941, he recorded 17 different varieties of the woody liana, Banisteriopsis capi, that were all, to his Harvard-trained taxonomic eye, the same species. Yet he was astonished to see that the Siona Sequoia could distinguish them consistently at great distance in the rainforest. When he asked them the nature of their classification, they of course looked at him as if he were a fool and said the obvious, that any botanist worth his or her salt would know that you took each of the 17 on the night of a full moon and each variety sang to you in a different key. Now that's not going to get you a PhD in plant systematics at University of California, Berkeley, but it's a whole lot more interesting than counting flower parts. And it also speaks of a different way of, of knowing. And the amazing thing to reflect is that this visionary world was almost lost. When I first lived with the Barasana in the 1970s, it felt like a place where something important had once happened and would never happen again. Colleagues of mine would make films with names like Disappearing Worlds to say that the, you know, Barasana are destined to slip away from history. And one who did that, Stephen Hugh Jones, head of the anthropology department at Cambridge, joined us recently as we returned to this northwest Amazon of Colombia, an area, incidentally, the size of France. If you ever want to go to the Amazon, that is the place to go. It is the most beautiful part of the Amazon. But as Stephen dropped in on this three-day ceremony celebrating cassava woman fertility rite, he couldn't believe his eyes. He walked into the longhouse, which is the size of this room. He saw 300 people in full ritual regalia engaged in this three-day ceremony, and he, he couldn't believe it. He got on the satellite phone to his wife back in London and said, Christine, you won't believe my eyes. The only thing that disappeared are the fucking missionaries. And... and <laughs> What, in fact, had happened, and we talked about this today, we have this sense of lament when we talk about indigenous cultures, as if it's a one-way road to, ex to exhaustion. Not true. What, in fact, happened in Colombia is one great president, Virgilio Barco, said to a great anthropologist, Martin von Hildebrand, Martin, do something for the Indians. And in five years as head of Indian affairs, Martin did more than something. He set aside in perpetuity an area of land in the Northwest Amazon, collectively the size of the United Kingdom, for 57 ethnicities and had it encoded in the 1991 constitution of the country and given back their land and behind a veil of isolation created by the troubles of modern Colombia, an utterly new dream of culture was born. And that's what brings back uh, people and their way of life. You know, it's interesting, I, uh, one of our great Canadians, Justice Sinclair, who's leading our um, reconciliation effort over the residential schools, said to me once, there's only three questions in life. Who am I, where do I come from, and where am I going? When the missionaries arrived, they essentially said to all indigenous people that all of the answers you've had for all of those questions for all of your history have been wrong. And when we asked the elders during this film project, why did you actually allow the missionaries to do what they did. And they said to us, because they promised they could make us human. And that is the fulcrum of cultural disintegration and rebirth. Well, let's move from the Amazon into the mountains that give birth to the river. You know, one of the most amazing things about the Amazon is it doesn't run to the sea, it's pushed to the sea by runoff from the Andean Cordillera. And the first 600 miles of its course, it falls 12,000 feet, and the subsequent 2,600 miles, it falls 240 feet. So it's literally pushed to the sea by the runoff from the Andes. So this geographical connection, of course, plays itself out in culture. And one of the things that Schulte said to me just before leaving as a young 18-year-old student, well, he said, he actually said two things. He said, first of all, uh, in order to placate my Victorian mother back in Canada, um, I, she asked that I could maybe go by him and get some final pointers. And I did, and he had three great um, suggestions. He said, don't bother with leather boots, because all the snakes bite at the neck. And then he said, uh, don't, don't forget to wear a pith helmet, because in 12 years he had never lost his bifocals. 
And then he said a piece of advice that most assuredly did not placate my mother. He said, don't come back without trying ayahuasca. And, uh, but then he also handed me two letters that might as well have been written by God. And then he said, I should look up his man in Columbia. And he had done for his protege a wonderful botanist by the name of Timothy Plowman, The Impossible. He had secured the dream academic grant of the 1970s, a quarter million dollars, which was a lot of money then, and a brand new red, red Dodge 4x4 pickup truck, all with the goal of studying a plant known to the Inca as a divine leaf of immortality. And this, of course, was coca, the notorious source of cocaine. And it was an extraordinary assignment because even though the illicit trade was beginning, and even though the plant had yielded cocaine hydrochloride, which to this day is our most important topical anesthetic, especially for nose, throat, and ear surgery, amazingly little was known. And even though the efforts to eradicate the fields had been going on for 50 years, long before there was a cocaine problem, in fact, those efforts had nothing to do with cocaine hydrochloride and everything to do with the cultural identity of those who revered the plants. But that's another story. We knew that during the time of the Inca, uh, the plant was revered as no other. You could not approach a holy shrine. Unable to cultivate it at the elevation of the imperial capital of Cusco, they replicated in gold and silver leaf and fields that colored the horizon. We knew that today no event occurred in the core of the Andean culture sphere that was not mediated by a reciprocal exchange of the power of the leaf, the puke, blown the essence to the apus, the deities, that hovered over every village. We knew that this was a central part of ritual activity, but we also did something that had never been done in 60 years and could have been done at any time. We did the first nutritional study of the plant and found out that yes, it had a small amount of cocaine hydrochloride, roughly analogous to the amount of caffeine in a coffee bean, and no one in the 70s noticed the irony that at every drug abuse conference, all the narcs bolted for the coffee pot at 10 o'clock in the morning. But in addition to the small amount of alkaloid absorbed benignly in the mucous membrane of the mouth, coca was chock full of vitamins. It had more calcium than any plant ever, ever studied by science, which made it perfect for a diet that lacked a dairy product, particularly for young mothers. It also had enzymes which enhanced the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, which made it perfect, of course, for the tuber-based diet of the Andes. So in one simple scientific assay, we put into stark profile the draconian efforts that are underway to this day to eliminate the traditional fields, and we showed this was a plant that had been used without any evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, for over 4,000 years in the Andes. And so over the course of a two-year project with Coca, both metaphorically and literally, became my lens upon which I came to understand the Andes. And I became very interested in this idea of sacred geography. And again, I don't mean that in the notion of, of hippie ethnography. I mean, what does it really mean to believe that the earth is alive and that your culture has reciprocal obligations to the earth, even as the earth owes your culture a proper way of living? Uh, you know, I was raised in the forests of British Columbia to believe that those forests existed to be cut. That was the foundation of the ideology of scientific forestry that I practiced in the, wood as a log, in the woods as a logger and studied in the universities. That made me very different than my friends amongst the Kwakwakawak, who believed that those same forests were the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven, the cannibal spirits that would have to be embraced during the Hamatsa initiation, such that the wisdom of the wild would come back to the community and the potlatch. Now the issue isn't who's right and who's wrong. Is that forest cellulose and board feet? Is it the domain of the spirits? The interesting thing is metaphorical. How that belief system mediates the relationship between the human population and the natural environment with profoundly different consequences in terms of the ecological footprint of a culture. I was raised as a Canadian to believe that a mountain was a pile of rock ready to be mined. That makes me different than my godson outside of Cusco in the community of Chinchero, raised to believe that a mountain is an apu deity that will direct his destiny. Now, this powerful belief is manifest in ritual activities and displayed in those activities. And so one of the most amazing events that I've ever participated in 
is something called the movimiento, where once each year, in this remarkably beautiful community, site of the summer palace of Topa Inca Yupanqui, the second of the Incan rulers, uh, the fastest young boy in every hamlet is given the honor of becoming a woman. And for one day, he must put on the traje, or the clothing of his sister or his family, and he must lead all able-bodied men on a race that is mandatory for all men, but it's not your ordinary race. You start off at 11,500 feet, you run 2,000 feet down to the base of the sacred mountain, Antikilka, and then you run to over 16,000 feet, only to fall away to the sacred valley and cross two more soaring Andean ridges over the course of a long 24-hour race slash ritual. The entire perimeter of the run is marked by holy mounds of earth where the wailaka must spin to bring the vortex of the feminine to the mountaintop where leaves are given to Pachamama, libations of alcohol to the wind. And of course the metaphor is so beautiful is that you go into the mountain as an individual but through exhaustion and sacrifice, remembering that the word sacrifice in Latin means to make sacred, you fuse into a single entity, a community that once each year in this ritual reaffirms its sense of belonging on the earth. Now at the age of 48, I became the oldest man and the only outsider ever to have run this race, and I only managed to complete it with the Wailakas by chewing more coca leaves in one day than anyone in the 4,000 year history of the planet. But actually, what really got me through is that over the 30 years that I had been engaged in this community, I had baptized any number of children, girls and boys, and when they heard that their padrino, who had bought so many cows for the family, was stupid enough to run the momento at the age of 48, they all came out and clung to me like a limpet, uh, like limpets throughout the entire day. Uh, they weren't about to let anything happen to their cash cow. But <laughs> These localized rituals of sacred geography play out in these fantastic trans-Andean events like the Koyariti, which occurs every year when the Pleiades reemerge in the southern skies. Tens of thousands of Andean peoples from all over the southern Andes converge on a sacred valley called the Sinicara, uh, overlooked by the three tongues of a glacier known as the Colcapunta. And it's a perfect expression of the syncretic reality of, of contemporary Peru. 500 years of Catholic faith fused onto pre-Columbian ideas. The structure of the ritual in many ways is Catholic. You have the notion of the stages of the cross. The individual crosses from communities throughout the Andes are carried on the back of pilgrims to the sacred valley and then by the Pablitos carried up high in the shadow of Ausangati, the most sacred mountain of the Inca, onto the ice where they rest implanted in the snow for three days, absorbing the power of Pachamama, and then they're carried back to their communities, um, recharged, if you will, for the coming year. Now, if a ritual like this expresses a sort of the perfect fusion of the two halves of Andean life, there is one place in South America where the pre-Columbian voice can be heard more or less unfettered, and that is in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia, this isolated volcanic massif that soars out of the Caribbean coastal plain to 20,000 feet. It is the homeland of the elder brother, the Wiwa, the Kogi, and the Arawakos, descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization which once carpeted the Caribbean coast of Colombia. In a blood-stained continent, these people were never fully vanquished by the Spanish, and to this day they remain ruled by a ritual priesthood. But the training for the priesthood is rather astonishing. The great Colombian anthropologist, Geraldo Raikaldomatov, lived with the Kogi in the 1940s, and he reported in a series of papers that the training for the priesthood involved the acolytes being taken from their families at the age of three, sequestered in a shadowy world of darkness for 18 years, two nine-year periods deliberately chosen to mimic the nine months of gestation in their natural mother's womb. Now they were in the womb of the great mother. And for that entire time, the world only existed as an abstraction as they were taught the 
values and convictions of their culture, which included the idea that their prayers and rituals quite literally maintained the cosmic balance of the world. He then reported that after that incredible initiation, suddenly the acolytes, as young men, were taken out of the darkness and led on a pilgrimage to the heart of the world, during which time they saw a horizon for the first time, saw a sunrise for the first time, and the priest who had trained them effectively said throughout the journey, you see, it's as beautiful as I've been saying all these years, it's yours to protect. Now that report from Reichel was almost an anthropological fable. It was almost too good to be true. No anthropologist had ever witnessed this process. And then this amazing thing happened. Uh, this man, Benito Villafania, walked into my office at the National Geographic with the Colombian ambassador, Vir uh, Carolina Barco, daughter of that wonderful president, Virgilio. And he had three priests with him from each of the three uh, communities, all barefoot in a Washington winter. And as Danilo was chatting us up, and they're extremely organized in a political sense, I couldn't help but interrupt him and say, you know, I don't mean to be rude, but you look an awful lot like an old friend of mine. And I pulled out this photograph I had taken in 1974, and the man on the right was Danilo's father, Adalberto. And I said, Danilo, you may not remember this, but when you were an infant, I carried you on my back for six months up and down the mountains with your father. And his father had been killed by the paramilitaries. And the lad on his right, Eugenio, is now this revered elder, second from your left. And based on this incredible connection and the sentiment that it implied, Danilo did the incredible. He invited us to go on a journey to the heart of the world. And what we found is that today the acolytes don't stay in the darkness for 18 years, but they do stay for 18 years in the immediate vicinity of the men's sacred uh, temple. Much of the time, in fact, at night inside the temple as they learn the incredibly Baroque religiosity of the, the belief systems of the people. And then indeed, they do go on a journey to the heart of the world where every ripple in the landscape as they move to the central core of the mountain, Saranqua, the goddess, ripples with mythological significance. And even the hats the Arawakos wear woven from sisal are a conscious effort to mimic the snow fields that envelop the high peaks of Saranqua. And as we did this pilgrimage, we got to the penultimate stage. And the, the metaphor is, of course, that you bring objects from the sea to the ice, from the ice to the sea. The main metaphor for all of the elder brothers is the, womb, the loom. They say, upon this loom, I weave my life. As they move up and down the mountains in life, they describe their movements as threads so that over the course of a lifetime, they weave a cloak over the body of the mountains. When they pray, they move their fingers like this because their thoughts and prayers are indeed threads. Uh, it, it's one of the most intense religious set of ideas you can ever have. And as we reached the penultimate stage of the pilgrimage, we came upon a circle of mamos in prayer and what had happened is that mercifully that day we were six hours late because the FARC knew we were coming and had set up in this community to kidnap us. And you don't really have a dramatic escape on a mule. You kind of clip-clop your way to rescue. And I was with this wonderful Bollywood film director uh, from, from um, uh, uh, Chenna and, and this, the, this Colombian filmmaker, and they were all freezing to death as we escaped under the light of the spectral moon. And I, I really liked the coca of the uh, Arawakos. I was happy as could be. And, but we escaped, and then, of course, we ran into a firefight, and we just were, had landed in a hornet's nest. But the wonderful thing was that we had trained at their request, the Arawakos and the Kogi, in cinematography. So we simply handed over our high-definition cameras, and they finished this section of the film for us as we moved back down to the coast, where even if the sacred sites are now covered by construction, it doesn't stop the elder brother from doing what they do best, which is praying for our well-being. And it's humbling to think that not two hours from Miami Beach, a pre-Columbian civilization is praying every day for your well-being. They speak in full sentences and paragraphs about our need to change the way that we interact with the world. They 
dismiss us as the younger brothers who have compromised the world itself. Well, I've always lived by the adage of Marshall McLuhan that if it works, it's obsolete. And just when I get interested in something, I want to do something else. And after four years in South America, I was keen to find another outlet for my, I suppose, my imagination. And that was always easy at the Botanical Museum because Schultes always had something up his sleeve. And in the early winter of 1982, he summoned me to his office and asked me casually whether I was interested in going down to the Caribbean island nation of Haiti, infiltrating the secret societies and securing the formula of a drug used to make zombies. Well, naturally, I said yes. Uh, and thinking that it was going to be a, an assignment of a fortnight, in the end it consumed four years of my life, because within 24 hours of arriving in the Afro-Caribbean reality, something was made available to me that had eluded me for four years in South America, and that was a window truly wide open to the mystic. You know, it's interesting, how do we get this idea of voodoo being something dark? You know, were I to ask you to name the great religions of the world, what would you say? Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever. What continents left out? Sub-Saharan Africa, the tacit assumption being that African people south of the Sahara had no religious beliefs. Well, of course they did. And voodoo is simply a fall word from Dahomey that means spirit or God. And in many ways, it's a quintessential democratic faith because a believer has direct access to the divine. The essential idea of voodoo is that the human being gives birth to the divine. And so at death, the body slips into the ground, the spirit is captured in a vessel. That vessel is initially seen to be part of the, associated with a particular individual deceased, but in time that vessel becomes part of the vast ancestral pool of energy out of which emerge the archetypes. And the archetypes of the 401 spirits of the voodoo pantheon, but in this quintessentially democratic faith, even the dead must be made to serve the living. To serve the living, they must become manifest. To become manifest, they must respond to the summons of the drums, the power of the chant, to come back from the world of the invisible, to momentarily displace the soul of the living, so for that brief shining moment, human being and God become one and the same. That's what spirit possession is. And that's why Haitians used to always say to me, you white people go to church and speak about God, we dance in the temple and become God. And when you're taken by a spirit, you cannot be harmed. And that's why you see these theatrical gestures slicing into the skin in Togo before a fetish symbol or in Haiti, acolytes in a state of trance handling burning embers with impunity, a rather astonishing example of the mind's ability to affect the body that bears it when catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. Where did we get the idea of voodoo being a black magic cult? The US Marine Corps occupied Haiti for 20 years early in, this, in the last century. Everybody above the rank of sergeant got a book contract. The books that came out had names like Black Baghdad, Voodoo Fire in Haiti, Cannibal Cousins, The Magic Island, The White King of Lagunav, the Pur a Puritan in Voodoo Land, and all these, all these books came out during the era of Jim Crow, written by Marines from the American South, and they essentially said to the American people, any country where such abominations occur can only find its redemption through military occupation. And they gave rise to the RKO movies of the 40s, Zombies, of the, uh, Zombies on Broadway, Night of the Living Dead, Zomb et cetera, et cetera. But Voodoo is simply the religion of Africa. So, we have this idea that these cultures, quaint and colorful though they may be, are destined to fade away as if by natural law, as if their failed attempts at being us, failed attempts at being modern. Nothing could be further from the truth. Change is no threat to culture. Cultures are always changing. Technology is no threat to culture. The Lakota did not stop being Lakota when they gave up the bow and arrow for the rifle any more than an American farmer stopped being American when he gave up the horse and buggy for the automobile. It's neither change nor technology that threatens the integrity of culture, it's power. In every case, these are dynamic living peoples, not frail communities, dynamic peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. 
And that's actually an optimistic observation because it suggests that if human beings can be the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. Now, I wrote a book based on my experiences in Haiti that was made into the worst Hollywood movie in history. And Hemingway said that if you sell a book to Hollywood, you should start off in Arizona, drive to the California state line, throw the book over, and go back to Tucson and have a drink. I, I didn't do that. I disappeared in the forests of Borneo. I always wanted to live in a place wet with the innocence of birth. In late in 1980s, I went to live with nomadic Penan, the last nomads of Southeast Asia. Why the attraction of nomads? Well, we were all once nomads, wanderers on a pristine planet, and it was only with the Neolithic Revolution 12,000 years ago that we succumbed to the cult of the seed and the poetry of the shaman, as Joseph Campbell said, became the prose of the priesthood. Nomadic societies are profoundly different. How do you measure wealth in a community where there is no incentive whatsoever to accumulate anything. Wealth is defined as the strength of social relations between people, because without that, everybody suffers. By the same token, sharing is an automatic reflex, because you don't know who will be the next to bring food to the table. I once gave a cigarette to a Penan woman and watched in my amazement as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably to every hut of the encampment, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. And by the same token, in these societies that do not have the written word, the entire knowledge of the community is embedded in the vocabulary and memory of the best storyteller. And in the same way that we can hear the voices of characters when we read a novel, I've always found in these non-literate societies whether it's the Inuit, the Taltan, and other Athabascan peoples, or the Penan, there's a, some kind of dialogue going on with the natural world, such that in the case of the Penan, the flight of a hornbill becomes, becomes a kind of cursive script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. But unfortunately, even by the time I was in Sarawak in 1988, the sounds of the forest had become the sounds of machinery. And we heard so much about deforestation in Brazil in the 1980s. Brazil produced about 1.3% of the tropical log exports at a time that Malaysia was producing 45%. And so in a single generation, a world was turned upside down. Rivers that once ran clear became so laden with silt that it seemed as if half of Borneo was slipping away to the South China Sea where the Japanese freighters hung light on the horizon ready to fill their holds with raw logs torn from the heart of the continent. Children forced into settlement camps, men humiliated, eventually standing up in a quixotic gesture, blowpipes against bulldozers, no power, no match for the power of the Malaysian state, and eventually, in a single generation, a way of life morally inspired, inherently right, had been crushed along with the force that gave it birth. Now, the Malaysian government said that it was imperative to get these primitive people out of the forest so that they could benefit from the wonder of modernity. Well, if that trade had been real, had they really gotten health services, education, technology, maybe it would have been something to consider. But all they got was squalor. And the chief minister of Sarawak, a man called Taib, who's been in that position for 45 years, a position that by Sarawak constitution precludes him from earning any income outside of his state salary, has amassed a fortune of $2 billion. And that money rests in Toronto, in Canada, and elsewhere around the world. And that's been the actual exchange of the forests of the Penan. Now, these egregious industrial intrusions are not limited to distant lands. This is my closest friend in Canada, Oscar Dennis, who's Taltan. Actually, this photograph appeared in the National Geographic, and women from around the world made a beeline a thousand miles north of Vancouver to Iskit, Oz would call me up and he'd say, you know, wait, there's this girl coming from Poland. And I'd say, Oz, what are you talking about? You just had someone from Moscow there. I said, I know. I said, you don't speak Russian or Polish. I know, but they don't really come for conversation. <laughs> and, but I once, I showed this photograph to our premier, a man called Gordon Campbell, a good man. And I said, let me tell you, Mr. Premier, about my friend Oscar. In the last five years, 
One brother's hung himself in his mother's basement. A second brother died 10 feet from shore. He never learned how to swim. Third brother killed by medical malpractice. Oscar's sister died of drugs and prostitution on the streets of Prince George. And Oscar's only daughter blew her head off playing Russian roulette with a handgun, which turned out to be a drug hit. And in those five years, Barrick Gold had taken 400 tons of gold and 5,000 tons of silver, a value of $25 billion out of... tall than lands, which by Canadian jurisprudence and law are unceded territories that do belong literally to the tall than people. And I said to the Premier, I'd like to know why there's not a hockey rink in Iskut. The infrastructure of that community did not change a bit. And today the tall Tan are fighting to protect the most extraordinary place in Canada. We call it the sacred headwaters. It's a point where by an amazing miracle of geography, our three great salmon rivers of home, the Stikine, the Skeen, and the Nass, are born in the same meadows. And the thing that's so interesting about this industrialization of our wild is that we take it for granted a mechanism that makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, what does it take to get a mine established in Canada? You meet a bunch of white guys in the golf course, you cobble together a company with less history than my dog, You secure online the subsurface rights to a place you've never been, the stories you've never heard, the pain of a long winter you've never experienced, and as long as you can guarantee the government a flow of revenue, either in the form of taxation or or, or royalties, you secure the right, by definition, to transform a place for all time. But the fascinating thing is that there's not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes the industrialization of the wild that places any value whatsoever on the land itself, or conversely, any cost to the commons implicit in its transformation. And we take that for a a given because it's the way we industrialize the wild. But it's not the way that most cultures around the world view the natural world. It's certainly not the way the Taltan and the other communities of the sacred headwaters view it. Now, step back for a minute, and let's go to a place which has the opposite set of values, the deserts of Australia. When the British first arrived in Australia, they saw people that looked strange, who had a primitive technology, but what really offended the British is the Aboriginal people had no interest whatsoever in progress. And the British, of course, found that offensive because progress was the ethos of Victorian life. And so in their inimitable way, the British concluded the Aboriginal people weren't human at all, and they began to kill them. In 1902, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether Aboriginal people were human or not. As recently as the 1950s, ranchers had quotas in Australia as to how many Aboriginal people they were allowed to kill with impunity in any given year. But what was actually happening in Australia was a devotional philosophy beyond the reach of the British imagination, and that was the dreaming. And the dreaming wasn't a dream. It was a notion of a state of perpetual existence in which past, present, and future were one and the same. In not one of the 670 languages and dialects of Australia was there a word for past, present, or future, or for time. There was only the dreaming. And the entire purpose of life was the antithesis of progress. It was, in fact, stasis. The entire goal of life was not to do anything to change the world, but to the contrary, to do the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. It would be as if all Western intellectual thought had gone into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it just as it was at the time when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. Now, the issue isn't to to say, again, who's right and who's wrong. Had we followed that devotional trajectory, we would not have put a man on the moon. But we also wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to transform the biological life support systems of the planet. And so if egregious industrial intrusions are one threat to the ethnosphere, perhaps the greatest threat is ideology, be it the cult of modernity or the Marxist mania that came down upon the peoples of Central Asia. I recently took this photograph at Angkor Wat of a nun who had had her feet and hands severed from her body for the crime of pursuing her religious faith during the era of Pol Pot. And if we go into Tibet, a place where I spend a great deal of time, we'll see the consequences of that moment when Mao Zedong, 
the man who has the dubious distinction of having been responsible for the death of more of his own people in his lifetime than Stalin and Hitler put together when he famously whispered into the ears of the Dalai Lama that all religion was poison, his holiness knew what to expect. And after the jackboot of the Chinese marched finally into Lhasa in 1959, 6,000 religious structures would be destroyed. 1.2 million Tibetan people would be killed for their faith. And what was it about the Dharma that so threatened the Marxist materialists of Beijing? All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was negative. He meant that shit happens. The cause of suffering is ignorance. By that, the Buddha didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of our own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the noble truths was a revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth and most consequential was the delineation of a contemplative practice that if followed not only had a possibility of a transformation of the human heart, but had 2,500 years of direct empirical evidence to suggest that that transformation would indeed occur. And so in making this film with Mathieu, it was a wonderful opportunity because as you can see from this photograph, to be in Tibet with Mathieu was rather like to be in Sherwood Forest with Friar Tuck. He was the most extraordinary man. I don't know if you know the writings of Mathieu, but his father was France's most famous uh, rational philosopher. His mother was a famous painter. He grew up in a house of luminaries in Paris. Believe it or not, he learned piano from an elderly Stravinsky. He learned photography from Cartier-Bresson. He learned anthropology at the feet of Levi Strauss. He himself was a molecular biologist studying in the lab of a Nobel laureate at the Pasteur Institute when he discovered, when he had the intuition that uh, there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. So he went back to the place he'd always been happy and became ordained as a Tibetan monk. Now with us on this journey was Shara Barma, a traditional Amchi doctor seen here quizzically examining my urine sample. <laughs> and under the guidance of the late Trusig Rinpoche, head of the Nyingma tradition, we embarked on this kind of journey of the heart to go to the flanks, as it turned out, of Everest. Not to do what most Westerners do, which is to climb into a zone of death and elevation at which oxygen deprivation alone obliterates consciousness, which for the Tibetans is just about the stupidest thing you could ever do. We went to be in the presence of a true wisdom hero of the East, a bodhisattva, a woman who had achieved enlightenment in this lifetime and elected to stay in the realm of samsara to facilitate the liberation of sentient beings. This was a woman who as a young girl had been stunningly beautiful. She had not wanted to marry. She'd been forced to be in, forced to be engaged to a wealthy merchant to escape his clutches. She crawled down a human latrine covered by excrement. She turned up at the Temboche Monastery. The Lama cleaned her up, dispatched her over the 23,000 foot Nangpa La Pass into Tibet. She became ordained as a Tibetan nun, recrossed the pass, went to a nunnery, and then entered lifelong retreat as a Satsampa Ani. And for 45 years, she had lived in a single cell, no bigger than the corner of this stage. She was elderly and Sherab was treating her, and we suddenly had permission to go and meet her. And so we began at the monastery of Shiwang in Solokumbu that clings like a swallow's nest to the southern side of the Himalaya. We participated in the Mani Rimdu, the 18-day ceremony that commemorates the transmission of the Dharma to Tibet during the um, era of Guru Rinpoche. And then we began this incredible journey high into the mountains of the Himalaya. And all this time, even as we stopped by the cave where, as part of Sherab's seven years of medical training, he had spent one full year in solitary meditative retreat, a cave he returns to for a month each year. And as we came around the backside of Everest through the Gama Valley with Mathieu chanting the sutras, we came upon, in time, this nunnery. And this photograph I'm about to show you was taken at the moment when sunlight fell upon this woman's face for the first time in 45 years. And by the terms of reference of our culture, she should have been a mad woman. But the face that greeted us radiated loving compassion. 
And at this point in time, Matthew said to me, this is proof of the legitimacy of the science of the mind of Tibetan Buddhism. The proof is the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And after we left the, uh, the uh, Sitsamba Ani to her devotions, 45 years, a single mantra recited day and night. We went to an adjacent um, monastery and the Lama said to me something really wonderful. He said, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And so the Tibetans leave it to us. The Dharma Sutra speaks about life being like a candle in the wind, stars fading with the dawn. It's upon that revelation that they see their future, but they leave it to us to ask why it is that we continue to tolerate the wrath of China that is attempting in so many ways to sweep away a civilization that has given so much to the world. So in the end, we have to ask ourselves a question, as Margaret Mead did. What kind of world do we want to live in? A monochromatic world of monotony, or do we want to celebrate a polychromatic world of diversity? The issue isn't the traditional versus the modern, it's the rights of free people to choose the components of their lives. The issue isn't to freeze people in time, but rather to ensure that all peoples can benefit from the genius of modernity without that engagement demanding the death of their ethnicity. Why is that important? It's because culture is not trivial. Culture is not decorative. Culture ultimately is a body of moral and ethical values that every culture places around each individual human being to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies within all of us. It is culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, find order and meaning in the universe, to do as Lincoln said, always seek the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, when the individual through volition or coercion turns his back or her back on tradition, perhaps aspiring to a level of affluence that in 90% of cases will be beyond their reach, such that they only find themselves landing on the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere, enmeshed in a kind of maze of disaffection and alienation, you simply have to put, look at the points of chaos around the world the shining path at the gates of Lima, the Maoists in Nepal, the butt-naked brigades in Liberia, the um, chaos of, um, of the sub-Saharan Sahal, and of course, in these photographs, the nightmare of Rwanda, photographs taken in the Genocide Museum, uh, this terrible inversion of ethnicity promoted by the corruption of colonial ideals. And so culture is not trivial, it matters. And every culture has something to say, and each deserves to be heard. Happily, some nation states are coming to terms with this. We in Canada were never kind to our native people, but things have changed. When the British first came upon the Inuit, they took them to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong, but one did more to honor the human spirit. And what the British failed to understand was that there was no better measure of genius than the ability to survive in that harsh Arctic environment on a technology that was limited to what you could carve from bone, stone, slate, and bits of flotsam that swept up from the sea. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. The runners of their sleds were originally made of fish, three Arctic char laid in a row and wrapped in the skin of a greased caribou. And when the British mimicked the ways of the Inuit, they achieved great feats of exploration, but mostly they failed to do so. When the last of Lord Franklin's men were found frozen to death at the Adelaide Peninsula, they were in the traces of a sled made of iron and oak in Manchester, England that weighed 500 pounds. On top of the sled was a dory from the ship that weighed 300 pounds, and inside the dory were all the accoutrements of a British naval officer's dinner service, including silver plate and a copy of the novel, The Vicar of Wakefield. And this they somehow expected to drag through the immense expanses of the Canadian North, hoping that they might bump into a Hudson Bay post and achieve salvation. Well, of course, they suffered a terrible death, but the Inuit moved lightly on the land, 
And when I was polar bear, uh, uh, not polar bear hun hunting, uh, this was polar bear hunting, that night the temperature dropped to minus 65, and we st I simply watched as they made this igloo, we got out the hides, ate the meat, and incidentally, despite what Greenpeace tells you, blood on ice in the north is not a sign of death, but an affirmation of life itself. And when I was narwhal hunting at the tip of Baffin Island some years ago, this man on the left, Eliak, seen here with his wife Martha, told me this wonderful story from his grandfather. During the 1950s, a dark time in Canadian history, our government forced the Inuit in the settlements to establish our sovereignty in the Arctic. Olayek's grandfather categorically refused to go, and the family, fearful for his life, took away all of his weapons, all of his tools, thinking that that would force him into the settlement. Did it? No. Middle of an Arctic night with a blizzard blowing, the old man slipped outside of the igloo, pulled down his caribou hide trousers, and defecated into his hand. As the feces began to freeze, he shaped it in the form of an implement. And when the implement forged by the cold from human waste took final form, he put a spray of saliva along the leading edge, and then he used a shit knife to kill a dog. He skinned the dog with the shit knife, improvised the traces of a sled with the leather of that fresh carcass, improvised a sled with the rib cage of that dead dog, and then harnessing up an adjacent living dog, shit knife and belt, disappeared into the Arctic night. Now talk about getting by with nothing. And in many ways, in many ways, that's emerged as a symbol of the resilience of life in the Arctic, but sadly there's something beyond their capacity to control. This is a photograph I took when I went walrus hunting in northwest Greenland, in Connacht, the northernmost community in the world, where the ice normally would come in in September and stay till July. Now it comes in November and is gone by March. So the entire world of the Arctic is melting. And this, of course, is something beyond the capacity of the people to adapt to. So in the end, I would just leave you with this idea that I hope you come away with a, from a presentation like this with an understanding that, as I say, every culture has something to say. And in the end, we need the prayers and hopes of these young Inuk children, just like we need the prayers of these young Tibetan monks, or indeed the hopes of this young warrior on the Serengeti Plain, because for all of us, for all time, their thoughts and dreams and prayers are part of our collective geography of hope. Thank you very much. I don't even know how to start to close that out. <laughs> um, I would like to say on behalf of UC Santa Cruz and the UC Santa Cruz Foundation, thanks to Wade Davis. Um, that was a fabulous talk and I will take so many things away from that. I would also like again to thank Anu Luther for his inspired choice of a, of a speaker and to Franz Lanting for uh, his contact. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we do have some uh, cookies and coffee and tea out in the lobby for you. Um, and Wade Davis also has some books for sale and would be willing to do some uh, signing of those books if you are interested. If you are interested, we would ask that you e enter on the left and leave on the right. Now, that's my instructions and I don't know from which perspective that is taken. <laughs> so, y you can figure it out. <laughs> But anyway, thank you very much, and we'll see you in the lobby. Take care. Yeah.